can't really speak for I've never done all of them. Let's go find it. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So our topic today and kind of this week is going to be structural engineering, kind of moving to our next discipline. Before we dive into that, just some reminders as far as where we are. So this is week three. You've got a reading assignment that's posted. Reading assignment's a little bit longer this week um, because uh, item number three, the bridge collapse paper. Uh, we've got material that's giving you background for that. And that bridge collapse paper is going to be a combination of the readings that we have here and the lecture that we have on Wednesday where I present kind of what happened on the bridge collapse. We'll talk about how it happened, why it happened, if it should have happened, who's responsible. Uh, talk about some of the, just the more structural engineering related elements. You're not supposed to be expert structural engineers where you can assess like, oh, it happened because of this. But we'll, combination of the readings and the discussion that we have on Wednesday, you should feel comfortable just kind of with your assessment. And it's kind of an opinion paper on what happened and who is responsible and some of the ethics involved. I did receive a question from a student as far as the, the ethics component. I guess both of the bridge as well as the, the poster that is assigned. And we'll talk more about a specific framework for ethics later in the term as far as the ASCE guidelines for ethics and how we should practice engineering. But ethics for right now in this term really just refer to your sense of morals, your sense of right and wrong. And we as engineers design systems for the public that they rely on for safety. You know, to get safe water, to get clean water to drink, to have bridges they can cross without them trembling and collapsing, things of that nature. And so when you're looking at your, your uh, poster assignment and considering some of those ethical things there, you're, you're considering both those sort of professional level ethics. Um, you know, there could be the professional level ethics of like, well, should this structure or these types of structures be built in the first place, depending on what it is. Um, and, you know, lots of different layers that you can tackle there. And so that theme for the poster is somewhat flexible, but I just want you to consider those kind of elements, as well as, uh, you know, looking at sort of racial considerations and societal kind of considerations, just because, you know, we as human beings have an ethical responsibility to our other human beings and, and the roles that we play as civil engineers impacts that and so you know we do participate in our system of just governance and everything where you know things that we design could have negative impacts on uh, on race on cultures on society at large so considering if your project has any of those elements touching on that uh, so I think that's kind of a good overview as far as where we're at uh, the bridge present, or excuse me, the poster presentation will be next Wednesday in class. The bridge paper I'll, I'll talk about and officially assign on Wednesday this week, and then you'll have a week and a half to work on that. It's due end of next Friday on Canvas. Any questions on any of those elements? Right now, okay. So with the poster. You were supposed to use the, the link I provided to kind of fill in uh, your topic. So this is what uh, has been added so far. So this look generally looks fine. Um, you know, group seven, you haven't added your topic. So if one of your group members can add that in, uh, that'd be great. Um, and otherwise, this will be kind of the, the collection of projects that we're looking at next week for our poster presentations. Okay. So moving into today and this week's topic of structural engineering, my objectives list the two divisions within structural engineering and explain their distinction. List four types of structures designed by a structural engineer and describe three responsibilities in structural engineering. So these are these should be relatively simple, right? You know, two big divisions, we're going to hit that here briefly. And then, you know, the structures, I mean, pretty much you could pick anything you know, look out the window 
every single structure that is built has some sort of some role of the structural engineer. So I just wanted you to be able to think about that, Liz described that. And you know, through the course of today's discussion and Wednesday's discussion, we'll talk a lot about different responsibilities and roles that the structural engineer fills. Okay. So uh, for my discussion today, I'm gonna sort of kind of lay it out addressing these four main theme questions kind of in order. So first we're going to talk just sort of generally what is a structural engineer. Then we'll talk about what they what they design, what they do in their day in, day out, and then how do they do their design. So how many people think they might be interested in structural engineering? So a decent number. So those that think they're interested, what do you think structural engineering is? What's attracting you to that interest, that discipline? Yeah. For me, it's just kind of the building aspect of it, like the buildings. So building specifically, or you're just like the tangible aspect of building something? Uh, maybe both. Maybe both. Yeah. Anyone else? Silence. It does it involve? Yeah, yeah. So civil is this like huge broad umbrella, right? And some of the disciplines are more technical in nature and require you know more calculations and just more code references and a little bit more difficult in some ways as far as that technical knowledge. And other professions require a little bit less of that. Um, so structural engineering is one of those more dense uh, disciplines. So it makes sense in the sense that structural engineers ultimately are making sure that the buildings and bridges and stuff don't fall down. So it's really, really critical. And some of those design elements just are technical in nature. And so that lends itself more to this discipline. And so that can be a help, a, a good sort of uh, uh, just thing to consider when you're looking at all the disciplines is whether or not that intimidates you or whether or not that attracts you. Um, so. We all have different preferences there, and uh, I'll leave you to decide if that's something that gels with your interests. So a general definition, this comes from the Journal of British Institute of Structural Engineers. But structural engineering is the science and art of designing a bunch of different structures listed, and basically designing those structures so that they can safely resist the forces to which they may be subjected. So we're designing structures. Those structures could be anything. Could be a building. Could be a bridge. Could be, uh, you know, water treatment plant. Could be just a simple table. And then we need to be able to assess the lows that that structure is going to have, and then be able to design elements and structural framework to resist those loads. So, in layman's terms, you know, we're just the ones that are responsible to make sure structures don't fall down. So, within structural engineering, this is certainly specific to the U.S. and probably uh, somewhat true across the globe, there are a lot of different structures that we can design. And if we have two big classifications as far as types of structures, one would be a building type structure and one would be a bridge type structure. We'll talk some more about the specific differences and why those structures are so unique. But then from those basic types of structures, we have a lot of code requirements that we have to meet. And I mentioned that structural engineering is a little bit denser, a little bit more uh, technical heavy. And so all the codes as far as, you know, the codes usually start with that load component. You've got a structure, what loads are subjected to it. And so the types of loads your building structure has are different than the types of loads your bridge structure has. So those load components are different. You've got different codes outlining that. Uh, and then you've got, once you assess that load side of the equation, you then have to design members, structural elements to resist the loads. And those structural elements, usually, you know, they're gonna be some sort of material. 
could be wood, could be concrete, could be steel, some other more sustainable material perhaps. And so there's usually going to be code references outlining that. And those code references actually are unique and different specific to the building industry or specific to the bridge industry. They're pretty similar. The underlying principles are the same, but ultimately you've got to go, if you're designing a bridge, you've got to go to those ASHTO references. That's the code requirement you have to meet. And sometimes, you know, the capacity of a given member in the ASHTO code might be 10% plus or minus different based on the equations and the theory that they've used versus the one in the building. So that's fine. We'll, we'll, as you start to navigate your structural engineering life, you'll understand that, you know, we're used to things being black and white, right and wrong. There's like one answer. In reality, life's not like that. You've got, for any given problem, there's not one solution, there's hundreds of solutions. And usually a, a solution that um, you might be looking at, usually it's maybe not quite as black and white, is it right or wrong, does it work or not? You know, sometimes there's like some, uh, a lot of gray in there. Um, so anyways, so those two big divisions, just to kind of repeat, are the buildings and the bridges. And the main reason why those are distinct is because all the requirements, all the codes that you have to follow are unique and different from it. So structural engineering, uh, not all structural engineers choose to become a licensed structural engineer, but many do. Um, I did become a licensed structural engineer, and so the licensure requirement for uh, structural engineering is a little bit more rigorous. But within that, you do specify, do you want to specialize in buildings so that the test and the licensure is going to be heavy on this side, or are you specializing in the bridge um, because those codes and stuff? So they are somewhat distinct. And so both partly because of the code references, but also because of just the nature of the business that ultimately any firm you work for they are developing relationships with clients that will hire them to do design. And the types of clients that you often will have for bridge type work, you know, they're often transportation agencies. And so you do a project with ODOT, you do a good job, they want to hire you again, you're building the, that business relationship, getting that repeat business. And so your clientele on the bridge side is a certain cohort of types of clients they usually don't overlap. The ODOT's not building a lot of academic buildings, or commercial buildings, or things of that nature. They just don't do that work. And so the client pool for bridges is very unique and different than the client pool for buildings. And so that kind of lends itself that your, your structural firm very often specializes in either buildings or bridges and develops those relationships accordingly. This is a, you know, your, your blue sheet or map of all your course requirements, all your prereqs, et cetera, that you have in the bachelor program here. The reason I have this up here is that structural engineering is nice in the sense that you're going to have a lot of required courses that if you like those courses, it's a good indication that you would like the work of a structural engineer. So your statics, your strength of materials, your structural analysis courses, that's kind of bread and butter of a structural engineer. And if you like those courses, you like those sort of bending moment diagrams and things that you'll end up doing with that, that's a good indication like, hey, this is something I enjoy. Um, and your actual calcs that you're doing in your design office are going to be very, very similar to that. And so structural engineering is somewhat unique. Uh, for some of the dis disciplines just because civil is so broad and structural was kind of at the foundation. It was one of the first disciplines, right? First structure you're building hundreds of years ago, you got to make sure it's standing up. So this was kind of the foundation, one of the things that all civil engineers did. And then the profession kept growing and growing, getting more broad. Um, and so the bachelor's education still has those sort of fundamental cores that we focus on. Uh, and some of the 
other disciplines kind of they lend that you don't get exposure to some of the other disciplines until kind of your junior senior electives and so you might just have like a course or two in uh, geotech or something where you're like oh that might be interesting but i don't really know uh, because i've only had a course with structural you have a series of courses and a lot of coverage there and so it helps kind of just give you more exposure to this discipline than some of the others. Okay, so question number one there, we've finished. So what do they design? So that's somewhat transparent. We already talked about this uh, somewhat, but in general, I wanna talk and focus this discussion, not just on the structures that they design, but the specific elements of those structures. So we mentioned that they designed buildings. Uh, that's one of the main divisions of their discipline. But what specific elements of a building structure do structural engineers design versus what an architect or someone else might design? So any, any thoughts, ideas there as far as that distinction between architecture and engineering? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a very, very good uh, summary there. You know, so like this high rise structure here, the basic geometry as far as like, oh, laying this out, you've got this curve face here, how many levels are you wanting to design, et cetera. All of that really was driven by an architect that had the vision for the tower that they wanted to build. And so typically that big picture overall design as far as general layout of things is architecture driven on the building side. But they work hand in hand with structural engineers because you know, if you want to design a hundred story structure, that's fine. But it doesn't matter what your vision might be if you can't fundamentally just accomplish it, right? And so structural engineers focus more on the framework of the structure the actual load supporting members, so columns and beams, um, you have some sort of shear wall or bracing system for lateral loads. And often with a lot of structures, that framework, that basic structural system that's supporting the loads might be a little bit hidden. You know, it's not uncommon with building design that buildings were often designing to last 100 plus years. When a building is initially built, there might be a vision for how they want to use that. But over the course of 100 years, you know, the tenants that are using the building, technology is going to change, society is going to change, how we want to lay out the interior of that space very much is going to evolve probably over that lifespan of the building. And so recognizing that unknown and just reality of change in the future, it's very desirable from an architecture and design standpoint to have a very open space that gives you flexibility. And so very often architects will want to have just like as few columns as possible, no walls at all that are structural walls so that they can lay it out with total flexibility. And then a new tenant wants to sort of move in and change things and move walls. If the walls aren't structural, they're just kind of a, space divider, it's easy to do that. You can just like tear the wall out and move it and stuff. And so that's often what we get with a lot of commercial type building design is just, we've got a series of framework that are critical column load um, path, you know, beam load path, et cetera, but then a lot of open space that provides that flexibility um, for whoever's owning and using that space to be able to use it. It presents a lot of challenges for the structural engineer to kind of make it as open as possible. Ultimately, you've got a structure, you've got big loads, you've got to have members to resist that. Um, and so it's very much a, a collaborative effort between the structural engineer that has, excuse me, the architect that has the overall vision for, hey, this is the space I want to create. And then the structural engineer that's a little bit more practical, like, okay, I see this is what you want. This is reality. We need to do this. 
and how do we sort of work together and figure out something we're both happy with as far as a compromise that can resist those loads, but still accomplish that vision of the, the space that you wanted to create. So another thing, structural engineers design bridges. So how are bridges unique and different than buildings? What are some of the, you know, let's, let's maybe think on the load front first, because that's step one for structural engineers, assess the loads that your structure is subjected to. So how are the loads for a bridge different? Yeah. Yeah, so you got this here. So you've got some sort of fluid dynamic load on the base there. That's certainly unique and different than buildings. Sure. Buildings can go up. Yeah, the basic sort of geometry. You got this long, skinny uh, structure for sure. Well, when you're building a bridge, the foot that goes on the other side of the of the of the, of the, of the river or something like that. Your foot to build a bridge. Yeah. So construction. Procedure would be very different, right? Like if you've got solid ground that you're building the bridge, uh, building a building up on, you typically have some sort of temporary structure to support elements, support beams, support concrete floors as you're placing and building it up. And if you've got solid ground, you can put a post here, put a post there. Pretty easy to do. With your bridge, you know, it's pretty different. If you've got this big 300 foot span or something, and you can't stick a post there because it's middle of the river. You know, how do you accomplish that? How can you do that? So that's something that I think is a, a wonderful kind of marriage, you know, all divisions with instructional engineering is the constructability piece. And it's kind of a fun little puzzle to try and figure out. And any structural engineer that's a good structural engineer is going to really uh, work to sort of master that because just proposing an idea, if you haven't thought through, well, how do you actually accomplish that idea? Might not be a very good idea. Yeah. The load that you're supporting is moving. It's not static on the structure. Yeah, you got a bunch of moving loads. You know, let's say you got a bunch of traffic. All of a sudden, then they slam on the brakes. You got inertial loads. Um, you know, just traffic and cars. Those types of loads are very different than. I mean, if you have a parking structure, you've got some of that. Um, but uh, you know, this classroom building here, very different types of loads. Sure. Mm -hmm. More wind? Yeah, so environmental loads are different. And, you know, buildings certainly get a lot of wind. You know, the exterior face of the building is going to be subjected to wind forces. Same thing here. But a very unique element of bridges versus buildings is that all your structural elements are outside. They're exposed to the wind, they're exposed to the rain, they're exposed to the snow, they're exposed to all those forces. You know, like here in Astoria, this is coastal region, a lot of salt, you know, in the water and the air, you get more corrosion and things from that. Versus if you've got a, a building right here on the shore next to this bridge, we've got some waterproof barrier that's the outside facade of our building, that even though you've got that corrosive, salty air, if you make a watertight structure for your building, it doesn't penetrate inside. So you don't have to worry about some of those environmental elements in a building structure as much as you do for a bridge structure because it is outside. Yeah. The loads that the bridges need to support are probably much heavier than what a building would be. Yeah, I mean, certainly loads are going to increase quite a bit as span increases. And with bridges, you get really big spans. And so those forces in your member is going to be a lot bigger. And so how can you design an element that can support that? Yeah. Yeah. So there's probably a lot more stress in those areas, I'm sure. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, certainly, you know, the load in this support column here is going to be much higher than, you know, let's say there's a column right there in this this building. The span on that column in the building might be like a 20 foot by 20 foot kind of area, about 400 square feet of load that's going to that column. Versus here, if you've got, you know, 300, 400 foot span of roadway going to it, a lot more surface area and influence area going to it. So all that is very good discussion, helping to sort of provide some of that context just for those distinctions between those types of structures. And it all sort of starts on you know, the types of loads you have, and those loads we mentioned are both sort of gravity loads that are subjected to, and environmental loads that often are lateral loads, wind loads, the hydra, the fluid loads there flowing through the river, et cetera, that we have to resist. Okay, so you've got those two main distinctions, but structural engineers are just people that design structures of any sort. And so you can design other things. The structural firm that I worked for before coming to Portland State, they developed some clients in aerospace industry, you know, bred into like working with uh, military out at Kennedy Space Center. And they actually uh, designed a, this is a mobile rock, rocket launch center that they designed. They also designed a new rocket launch uh, tower that was the you know, first rocket launch tower built in the last you know, 30, 40 years uh, at a Kennedy Space Center. And so it all was, you know, that fundamentals as far as you got loads, you got members, you got to design, what are those forces? Um, that's the, the role of a structural engineer. And then that business side of the equation where you're just like developing relationships and do a small project, do good work, do a bigger project, do good work, keep getting sort of uh, just word of mouth that way. Okay, that's how that sort of developed. So that was kind of, kind of cool to work on that. I grew up sort of a space nut. I went to space camp in sixth grade. And so about 10 years ago when I was working for them, I actually got to go out to Kennedy Space Center and I was not on this rocket launch tower, but I was on a rocket launch tower doing some inspection with a rocket in the actual tower. The rocket didn't have fuel in it yet. It was going to be launched like two weeks later or something. But, you know, the rocket was right there next to me. Um, I don't know. It was pretty cool. So. There's just lots of structures out there. So any of those types of elements or things that we haven't touched upon, you know, still there's a there's a structure with load, structural engineers are going to be involved. So what do they do day in, day out? What's their life look like? So I got a list of questions here. How do structural engineers spend most of their time? So I've got A, deciding general layout, look of structures, B, calculations, C, on-site monitoring construction, D, design drawing, E, meetings or other. How many people think they're working on A? Wow, that's a trick question. Good job. So yeah, A, that's more architects, right? You know, they're, they're getting that sort of general layout. Once that general layout is uh, established, you know, then engineers start um, collaborating on the process. How about number B, calculations? Yeah, that's a big part of their job. And so, you know, I would venture to guess probably every single day, probably they're running at least a simple calculation. Um, and any sort of plan set that they produce, there's some sort of permitting agency, permitting review, code-based review that it has to go through. So like here for the city of Portland, if you're working on a building, you've got to submit those plans to the city of Portland to get permitted. They review the plan set, they review the calculations that you submit. Um, it's a pretty rigorous review process. Um, and until they sort of feel like all your I's are dotted and T's are crossed, you know, you don't get that permit to actually then be able to construct the structure. How about number C, on-site monitoring construction? 
couple hands. So construction is an exciting part of your job and of any sort of project life cycle, but it ends at, it's the end stage of the life cycle, right? Like after you've worked on that sort of preliminary design, developed that design, gotten things through permit, then it goes to construction. And so if you've got a project that is going under construction, then certainly you're going to be making trips out there. You know, this may, this probably isn't a daily activity. The exception to that might be an entry level position. You know, sometimes if you've got a big project that's going to construction, it might be in, under construction for two years. And during the heavy sort of structural framework elements, that's often kind of the first half the project. So maybe that first year is really structure is heavy. And depending on how that construction contract is set up, there is oversight that's required. Sometimes they elect to hire the engineer of record, the structural engineer firm, to provide that oversight. Other times the contractor hires like third-party inspectors to do that. But um, there certainly is a lot of on-site monitoring that occurs. There's kind of a, a smaller threshold that the structural engineer by law is required to review. There's more regular sort of daily, weekly oversight that's required that could be provided by that third party. Uh, but so there are, you know, our engineers that are on site, you know, certainly weekly, if not daily during those construction um, periods of a project. Touching upon that, I mean, I mentioned that structural engineering is very much an art thinking about, well, how can we build the things? How can we, considering these lows, design something and think about how you can accomplish that? And so, some, you know, there's some people I know that they sort of grew up in construction families and so they sort of had a, that exposure growing up and, you know, maybe it's a little bit more intuitive to them. I didn't have that. And so when I got into uh, engineering, I was pretty green as far as that whole sort of construction element. And so I highly encourage any opportunity any engineer has to get to go out on site, um, do a field trip, do a walkthrough, you know, take pictures and just kind of see, you know, often you're asked to sort of go out there for a specific element. And you go out there and inspect, inspect a specific element. But then you just look at all the other activity that's going on and, you know, sort of just observe it for a little bit. You can learn so much. And, you know, often when I have these sort of questions in the office, like, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? And you go out and you actually just see how contractors are doing in this specific element. It starts like the wheels firing and gives you sort of some. Uh, building blocks that then you can apply to other projects. Uh, D here, design drawings. How many people think working on drawings a lot? Yeah, so I guess this is just sort of the general, are there drawings that engineers are, are working on? Yeah, so I mean, the, you know, the, the list here as far as the, the elements that you're working on, you know, design drawings probably take the most time. Um, that coordination, you've got the basic framework, the basic layout you get from the architect, uh, but then looking at the loads, detailing members that can um, resist those loads, coordinating with the architect, putting all your details on the drawings, uh, that's huge. So I would say that's probably the, the biggest component on this list. Calculations is maybe second. And, you know, a close third. And, you know, this can kind of vary depending on where you are in the hierarchy of the firm. It's just the meetings. You know, you can have a lot of meetings. Meeting with clients, meeting with architects, meeting about potential projects. I would say early on in your career, you would be heavy on the design drawings and the calculations. And then, you know, you might live in the office a little bit more, and that's kind of what you're working on under someone's supervision. You know, if you've got a project that's under construction, you, you could be going out there, spending a lot of time on the construction site. And then as you sort of advance up in your career, get a little bit more project management experience, then you start having a big component here as far as those meetings. 
So, you know, the, the principal at the firm that I work at, you know, I would say that probably three quarters of their time was meetings and, you know, a quarter combination of the other sort of topics, but it just sort of varies depending on where you're at there. With all this though, there's ample opportunity to have a diverse sort of day and lots of different things going on. And I think there's something that's beautiful in this discipline and probably any of the other civil disciplines too, is that with these diversity of different daily tasks, we all probably have preferences that I might like, you know, B and C more and someone else might like D and E more. Uh, and if you've got those preferences, you can often within your firm, you know, seek out those activities that you enjoy more. Every job's going to have things that we don't like to do, and you just kind of got to get through them. But often, there is opportunity to kind of work on the types of projects or do some of the activities that you like a little bit more uh, than others. So, you've got buildings, you've got to be working on the design. The industry is really at a exciting time because with the advances that we have in computers, we've got some pretty cool tools in our toolbox that we get to use. And so the design used to be all just sort of 2D paper-based design, and it's really almost as a standard now that you've got pretty sophisticated 3D modeling that happens. That's pretty fun. I like 3D models. I think all of us do. It's kind of cool to see that and sort of build that model. It's really advantageous when you start collaborating with other disciplines, because we can have our structural model and an architectural model and a mechanical model, and then they all get sort of meshed together where they are one complete model. And that can help with you know, different sort of uh, clash detection type things where you can see conflicts between maybe what a mechanical engineer's design and this beam that I have and stuff. And if you can identify that stuff during this design phase, it makes construction go much smoother. We also have you know, structural analysis models. Often those are kind of a separate model that the structural engineer sort of builds. Um, and you know, those start with basic geometry that you input, then you've got all the loads that you're putting on those members, and then you run some analysis and you can you know, play, with, uh, play with the system and you know, help you with that design process. And there's calculations galore with this discipline. You know, these calculations are kind of from your basic sort of static strength of materials class, structural analysis class, and you'll see this exact same thing with pretty much any structural plan set you're submitting for permitting you're going to have these exact models, these exact sort of images, equations. Um, so this is sort of bread and butter day in and day out. There's a lot of cool technology that all engineering disciplines get to use, but I'm maybe more familiar with the structural ones just because it's my niche industry. <laughs> the reality is for buildings, We've got a huge, huge inventory of existing buildings. And so your work as a structural engineer is not just doing new construction, but doing renovation to existing structures. Because both from a cost perspective, as well as a sustainability perspective, you know, it's much more sustainable to renovate this building upgrade the structural system for this building, then just tear it down and build new. And so we want to do that as much as possible. One of the cool, exciting technologies that, uh, that we have now, one of the biggest forces that our structures can experience are earthquakes. Our scientific understanding of earthquakes have evolved a lot over the last 100 years, you know, even the last sort of 20 years. I worked on a project looking at a concrete building here in Portland that was built in the 70s. And 
the seismic loads that code said that building needed to be designed for the 70s versus the revised code of today based on our more modern understanding of seismic activity. The forces were two and a half times bigger. So hugely substantial increase in forces, right? But we don't want to just tear down those buildings, so we need to sort of figure out, well, how can we strengthen these buildings so that they could resist things? And earthquakes are one of those things that they are huge forces when they occur, but thankfully they don't occur daily, right? Um, and so uh, we can sometimes have the illusion that, hey, this structure seems fine, it's standing up because it's just sort of experiencing gravity loads predominantly. But then you get a big lateral load, a big seismic, and it can crumble rather rapidly. What's pictured here is a base isolator. Um, so this was a retrofit to, to a building. Base isolator is kind of like this big kind of rubber spring that the idea, the forces you get from an earthquake is that the ground starts shaking. If your building's attached rigidly to the ground, which is sort of the standard that we've always had, then the building is going to shake side to side with that. And inertia is one of Newton's sort of first principles, right? So you've got, you put an object in motion, it's got inertia to stay in motion. But then the base support moves the opposite direction You've got the inertia is trying to tear the building apart from the foundation. And so a base isolator is basically this big kind of rubber spring that you actually isolate the upper structure from the foundation so that the foundation can do all the shaking back and forth, but you don't transfer it to the upper structure. And so it can greatly reduce the, the shaking and the load transfer and everything that your structure experiences. And it's had great success in particularly sort of, um, Japan has designed and used these extensively. They are being used you know, more in the US, but we're a little bit slower to adopt some of that technology. But this here is a short little video showing that where we've got two model scale structures. One that's attached rigidly uh, I think this one rigidly to the uh, foundation of one that had a base isolator to it, and then they just are on a shake table, so they're shaking back and forth. We got the base isolator there. You can see that structure on the right, not getting all those inertial forces transferred at all, same degree. So it's kind of the principle of how those base isolators work. Okay, construction oversight. So certainly you do have construction oversight. You know, there's code requirements as far as specifically what is required. Um, and the structural engineer has certain uh, requirements to be out there. For a concrete structure like this, you know, the concrete, you've got rebar that provides load bearing capacity and, and tension capacity of your members. Concrete is really good in compression, but not good in tension. Um, and so the rebar is good in tension as well as provides good sort of confinement for the concrete. So you always have both of those elements together. But, you know, if you're going out here and you see the assembled rebar, you'd want to be able to inspect that before it's poured because once it's poured, you know, it's hidden by the solid face of the concrete. And so it's harder to investigate and sort of figure out um, if it was installed correctly. So. You know, you're going to have different oversights that's going on, just making sure that what you put on your drawings, your plans, is actually what's getting built. That, again, is a easier and improved process because of all the 3D modeling that we have now and technology, where you know, sometimes it's a little bit harder to decipher a 2D drawing and the, into a 3D, you know, reality, and you get some... Uh, 
incorrect interpretations of those drawings, or maybe the engineer might leave something out that they would need to include, that by having a, a three-dimensional drawing, uh, you, you can alleviate some of that. So that's sort of helping, and you'll see more uh, contractors out there with iPads and different things, you know, looking at some of the models as they're sort of constructing these things. But you'll still have engineers going out there just inspecting and verifying and making sure that it's meeting their expectations based on what they design and their intent for the structure. And so that's super rewarding. I love going out there. And, you know, engineering as a whole compared to so many other industries where you can be working day in, day out, working, you know, year after year, and sure, all jobs provide some income, provide some sort of way for you to make your living. But, you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you might be like, well, what's the point? You know, what, what, how does my job giving value or giving some sort of meaning to society or just meaning to me? And with engineering, where you go out there and you see the work and the plans you've you know, been sweating over and then it gets built into this tangible structure, I can't say how amazing that feeling is and how rewarding that makes you feel um, and just makes you feel like your job has your purpose. Um, and that's really, really cool for engineering. You know, that feeling is all disciplines. So it's not just structural, you know, environmental, transportation, et cetera. You're going to have that same tangible effect. Um, and so that's a beauty of all the civil disciplines. Okay, question. So structural failures occur. Got four options here. Never, rarely, sometimes, or frequently. How many people vote A? How many people vote B? Rarely, I see some hands. How many people vote C? That looks like most people. How many people say D? People. Okay. So someone has said sometimes. Why did you say sometimes? And and what was your I guess maybe time scale for sometimes is subjective. Yeah. Thinking on like a worldwide basis because like I mean there was just an earthquake just in a day and like lots of structures collapsed. So it really depends on where it is and where the codes are, but like on a worldwide mm -hmm. like spectrum it's happening on a fairly regular basis. Okay. Sure. I didn't choose the place, so maybe I should. You chose frequently, right? Yeah. What did you say for frequently? Well, a building collapses every day. I can say that for sure. I know that's like sure. If you look it up in the news, you can definitely find a building collapsing every day if you want. So I, I would say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so we all have different sort of thresholds and sort of ways that we interpret this question. You know, the reality is that when you look across the globe as far as structures that have been built, and like in Portland alone, we've got more than a million structures, right? And so then you look across the globe where we've got, what, approaching 8 billion people. Uh, that's a lot of structures. And some of those structures are thousands of years old. Some of them are, you know, newer structures. So you've got a whole host of lifespan there. And so from that perspective, I agree that, yeah, we have collapses, you know, if not daily, certainly on a, uh, weekly annual basis, you'll have some some small scale collapse. Some of those might have been engineered. Some of them might not have been. Uh, for if we isolate it, maybe more to our country, where we've got you know maybe a, a more robust sort of code uh, system than some other countries. You know, their collapses do occur, but I'd say in general they occur a little bit less frequently. But I think this is uh, kind of at the heart of the importance and the obvious need for structural engineering is that any sort of collapse is bad. And you're going to, at the minimum, have a lot of economic loss and more frequently, loss of life. And so we want to understand why failures have occurred. There's a lot we can learn from studying those so that we can understand the sciences better and update things. So some of it, like the earthquake, you know, where you might have an earthquake, that could be partly a function of just improved science where, yeah, we used to think that the loads were this, the building was built 50 years ago, 
Now we understand the loads are actually a lot more, but that building hasn't been upgraded and it experiences that earthquake. Yeah, you could get collapse or just some severe, severe damage. So what I want to touch upon here uh, is the I-35 bridge. This was a collapse in 2007 in Minneapolis. So short little background if you're not familiar with it here. On the evening of August 1st, 2007, the I-35 West Mississippi River Bridge was filled with rush hour traffic that had come to a near standstill. At the time, the bridge was undergoing general maintenance that had left four of its eight lanes closed and over 260,000 kilograms, or 260 tons, of construction materials resting on the bridge itself. Shortly after 6 p.m., drivers heard a loud snap echo from one of the bridge's beams. This was followed by a louder crash and considerable trembling and shaking throughout the structure. Seconds later, a 300 meter or 1,000 foot section of the bridge's deck collapsed. The southern sections of the bridge fell straight down, landing either in the Mississippi River or on its banks. Meanwhile, the northern end went crashing down into a rail yard, crushing three unoccupied freight cars. The impact of the fall was so great, it broke the deck into multiple large pieces of steel and concrete. 111 vehicles were caught in this collapse, with 17 of them falling into the waters of the Mississippi River. Others were left balancing precariously on the remaining pieces of the bridge, or ended up lodged in the river's muddy banks. The emergency response... All right. Uh... You know, there's a lot more you can sort of look at that sort of study that at least gives you a little bit of a background if you weren't uh, familiar with this collapse. But pretty, pretty shocking, right? You hear rush hour traffic, lots of people just trying to get on with their life. You know, go to work, get home, pick up their kids, do whatever they need to do. And then, you know, sudden and rapid collapse, all those uh, vehicles drop into the river. Um, I couldn't imagine that. So... How and why did this happen? So, you know, that video touched upon something, you know, talked about staging of construction materials, closing down some lanes. Uh, so maybe there were some higher loads subjected near where that failure point occurred. You had rush hour traffic, so those traffic loads were at their heaviest. One of the things we talk about with engineering as far as that loads that you're subject your structure is subjected to, and we generally design for that worst case scenario where you've got it filled up with traffic. Um, but there is a bit of a loading cycle that we typically experience, like, right, where you've got traffic sort of flowing across the bridge, and so it sort of loads a member and unloads a member, loads a member and unloads a member. And generally speaking, um, a member is going to have more service life if it's not loaded 100% of the time. You know, if you've got permanent static load, those are harder and can lead towards other types of failures. So those staging of materials that were just permanently there, that you know maybe was a contributing factor because you weren't didn't have any sort of cyclical loading. This is your basic sort of structure. It did go through a bridge inspection in 2003. I think the collapse they said was 2006. Is that what the data had? My previous slide, 2006, 2007, somewhere around there. And the bridge inspection, this is the failure point uh, that started the collapse. And if you actually look at it closely, this gusset plate, this is a big sort of steel plate that sort of goes on either side that provides a connection between different members of your bridge. You actually can see some bowing out of that structure plate right there. That's and actually early sign of some overload, some buckling of that plate. And, you know, with the bridge inspections, you know, they often are looking at the condition, you know, where they're like saying, okay, you know, do we see any sort of rust or corrosion? You know, they're looking critical at sort of bolts because those are often sort of failure points. Like, hey, are, are these looking worn? Do we need to replace those? You know looking at basic sort of maintenance as far as painting and just sort of touching up on things. Uh, I don't know that they were looking uh, 
big picture of much in, in sort of causing alarm for that buckling of that plate, but that actually was an early warning sign. Obviously, we had the failure, and so there's a big investigation. And so this bridge, I think, I meant to look it up this morning. I forgot. I think this bridge was built in the 60s, so I think it was in service for um, you know 40 or 50 years before the collapse. And so it's been in operation for a long time. But they discovered in the uh, transportation investigation after the collapse that that gusset plate actually was undersized by half. It was a half inch gusset plate, and based on the load that it was subjected to, it should have been a one inch gusset plate. Why this, I think, is interesting and just sort of uh, helpful to talk about is that with our load design, we are calculating sort of loads on one side, and then we look at the capacity of a member on the other. And so if this member's half is thick, obviously that capacity is going to be less. But typically, the way, the approach we have is that we take our capacity, and then we divide by a safety factor. Because, you know, you don't want the loads and the capacity to exactly equal, because then if you just slightly increase the loads by 5%, boom, you get collapse. So we always have this sort of reserve capacity for our uh, capacity side where we divide by that safety factor, and sometimes that safety factor is two, you know, so you got double the capacity. And that load side, you know, we're typically looking at the worst case scenario where you've got max, you know, traffic on the bridge, et cetera. And so often you sort of don't have that. You've got lighter loads, and so that can sometimes um, uh, uh, lower the load side of the equation. But, you know, this, this ended up being in service without issue for 40 years, even though a member was half what it should have been. And so, based on our approach in our country, and I think sort of globally, where we've got that capacity uh, safety factor included, that contributes to structural fail failure occurring much less frequently. Because even if engineers make mistakes, you've got all those calculations they're working on, you've got all those loads, you're trying to sort of keep track of things, you've got people that are checking your work, et cetera. You know, so this made it through permitting, you know, with a plate that was undersized half what it should have been. And still, it worked for 40 years because maybe the loads are a little bit less, um, that safety factor was providing that extra strength um, until ultimately we, we did get some failure. So, you know, it's good to study these. You know, this could have been prevented. You know, it certainly could have been prevented in the design stage, could have been prevented in that sort of uh, permitting stage where they were reviewing the calcs. Uh, could have been prevented here with a little bit more rigorous oversight in this uh, bridge inspection. People asking the question, hey, is this a little buckling of the plate? Well, what are the loads on it? What well, is this a concern? Unfortunately, it wasn't cut then. So, if you just sort of Google failures, you, know, you can get this sort of list in Wikipedia. And if you look at the, you know, it's, not a absolute list, like my, my house collapses, it's not gonna make this list. Um, but you know, this is like big, big collapses. It's got, you know, breaking up in history. But you know, if you look at some some time scales here, I am a little disturbed. Like when I was growing up, I didn't feel like you'd hear like you do daily almost now about different collapses. Some of that I think is just like the news cycle is so much more robust now that you hear about a lot of different things maybe than I did in, as a child in the 80s. But if you look here in the sort of 80s, you often would have like, oh, three or four sort of major collapses across the world uh, on an annual basis. You know, you slide down here to more modern times, and you start to see a lot more. Like, you know, here in 2021, you know, what is that like? more than 10, 15 or something sort of collapses uh, on a global basis. So uh, I do feel like there's a disturbing increase here uh, as time has sort of grown on. Some of that could be a, a function of just the age of this infrastructure that it was built. 
100 years ago and reaching the end of its service life. Uh, there could be a lot of different contributing factors, but <clears throat> I do think you know we have a strong ethical obligation as engineers to you know understand these, improve upon these, to really kind of make sure that collapse is really rare and not a, an acceptable level of design. All right, where was it? So we're going to talk, uh, you know, at length on Wednesday about the Florida International Pedestrian Bridge collapse that happened in March, 2018. It's a nice key study to look at. So last topic here, wrap up in our last four minutes. How do they design? So the basic process, I've already touched upon some of these. It all starts with those forces your your structure is subjected to. So you got to determine those forces. Once you discern, uh, determine those forces, you want to select a material so you can start specifying things. The codes based on strength and capacity of members are uh, material specific. So you kind of got to know that first. Sometimes that material is driven by you know, a vision the architect might have. Other times the instructional engineer might play a role in helping to select that material. And then you got to sort of figure out a basic sort of structural system for that. Um, you know, see, a way to lay out the building, lay, way to lay out the structure so that you can resist both the, the gravity loads as well as the lateral loads um, that you have. You're going to analyze the structure and then specify members. With that basic sort of equation I talked about, you've got the demand side, that's your load side for your members, and that's got to be, uh, oops, that equal sign is going the wrong, or the greater sign is going the wrong way. It should be this way. That demand's got to be less than your capacity divided by your safety factor. So, just a comment on loads. I already talked about sort of gravity loads in general. You know, gravity loads, dead loads, those are permanent loads. Generally, that's the structure itself, anything attached to it. Live loads are sort of uh, temporary or transient loads. So it could be us in this classroom building, could be cars on the bridge, anything of that nature. A snow load would also be a type of gravity load. Anything that's just like a vertical gravity load uh, you're designing for. And then lateral loads are huge loads that your structure has to uh, resist. These are more temporary in nature. You know, wind recurrence interval is a little bit more frequent. You know, we've got light wind every day, big wind, a little less frequently, but still we get it. Earthquake even more infrequent, but uh, we can't forget about those. So wind forces are huge, hurricanes, massive destruction, right? So what do you guess the basic design speed for a hurricane is? So let me ask another question here first. What's the biggest wind speed you've experienced? Like standing outside, feeling. Yeah. 50? Could you stand? Not very well. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of got to lean into the wind. Yeah, 50 is a massive wind force. For sure. Anyone else? Yeah. I stood in a hurricane a couple of times in Florida. Really? Yeah. How do you know what the wind speed was when you were standing there? I don't. Yeah. Okay. But it was tough, like you're saying, like that kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember like a big wind. Like I was in North Carolina for school, and a, a hurricane was coming through. You know, I was inland, maybe a hundred miles. Or so, so it was a lot less, but still a huge wind there. I've been out in the gorge sometimes where the wind's just howling and having to lean into it. But you know, often those wind speeds that I was experiencing were like in that 30 to 50 range. That it's really hard to stand up straight. You know, if you've got like a hat or anything on your head, it's being blown all over. My glasses blowing off my face, things like that nature. So anything above that is a major wind force. And for your hurricane. Depends on the region you're at, 
But you know, you're often you're down here at the before 180 miles per hour. Just order magnitude, something crazy, crazy big. Um, you know, other parts of the country uh, dissipates out if you're not in those sort of hurricane prone regions, but really big forces. And so it's just kind of eye opening from a structural perspective when you're looking at a structure and what the loads are. Geography plays a big component to that as far as the wind forces or seismic forces you could have, but they're really massive um, and really huge loads of your structure as a resist. Okay, uh, see where our time, so we'll stop there and talk about bridge collapse on Wednesday.